Ο επόμενος ομιλητής μας επίσης δεν είναι μεταξύ μας. Βρίσκεται στο Λονδίνο. Είναι νομικός εντεταλμένος συνήγορος της Βασίλισσας της Αγγλίας, ειδικευμένος στα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα. Έγινε γνωστός ως δικηγόρος σε δίκες με μεγάλη δημοσιότητα και παγκόσμιο αντίκτυπο. Εκπροσώπησε μεταξύ άλλων τον Σαλμάν Ρουζδί, το σχολείο Σάμορ Χίλ, τον πολεμικό ανταποκριτή της Washington Post, Τζόναθαν Ράνταλο, τον Τζούλιον Ανσάντ, τον Λούλα Δασίλβα, ενώ ανέλαβε υποθέσεις των αβοριγίνων της Τασμανίας, της Διεθνούς Αμνηστίας, των θεσμών που ασχολούνται με τα εγκλήματα εναντίον της ανθρωπότητας. Ήταν ο πρώτος πρόεδρος του Δικαστηρίου Εγκλημάτων Πολέμου στη Σιέρα Λεόνε, με την Αμάλ Κλούνεϊ και τον εκλυπώντα Νόρμαν Πάλμπερ, υπογράφουν την έκθεσή τους προς την ελληνική κυβέρνηση το 2015 με τίτλο «The Case of Return of the Parthenon Sculptures». Είναι συγγραφέας βιβλίων, μεταξύ των οποίων «Σε ποιον ανήκει η ιστορία, η λιλασία του Έργιν και η διεκδίκηση της επιστροφής του κλεμμένου θησαυρού». Το βιβλίο αυτό ενέπνευσε το Διεθνές Κίνημα για την επιστροφή των κλεμμένων πολιτιστικών αγαθών στην περίοδο της επιοκρατίας. Όπως σχολιάζει η, μεταφράσταση, η μεταφράστρια Σώτη Τριανταφύλου, σε αυτό το βιβλίο ο, Robertson, ο Geoffrey Robertson συγγνώμη, αναλύει με μαχητικότητα γιατί τα λεγόμενα ελγίνια μάρμαρα δεν είναι ελγίνια και γιατί πρέπει να επιστραφούν στο φυσικό του χώρο στο νέο μουσείο της Ακρόπολης. Πρόκειται για τον κύριο Geoffrey Ronald Robertson. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. If you can see me, I can see I'm up on the screen, so I presume you can. I'll speak. A... Good. I will speak a little slowly in case there's need for a translation. But I'm going to talk to you, and it's a great privilege to do so, about reuniting the Parthenon marbles. They are, of course, the greatest example, the only example of the wonders of the ancient world, the only example that is extant today, albeit they are bifurcated and uh, part stolen by Lord Elgin in the British Museum, the other part is in the new Acropolis Museum where it all belongs. Now, there can be no doubt at all about the importance, not just to Greece, but to the world of the Parthenon marbles. Let me say for a moment what uh, has been said about them. Firstly, by UNESCO, which regards them as the supreme expression of architecture. It, in fact, uh, calls them, when it listed them, universal symbols of the classic spirit and civilization, the greatest architectural and artistic complex bequeathed by Greece uh, to the world. And the British Museum itself, which hoards them like uh, a receiver of stolen goods, which it is, says the marbles rank above the highest achievements of mankind, not only for their aesthetic qualities, but for the central place in the cultural history of ancient nations. So it is on any view an important matter for the world, not just for Greece, to have these marbles reunited, seen on the below the Parthenon, beneath the blue attic sky. What is the problem? Well, I think it was very well described by Professor Joan Connolly in her, from Yale University, who says, the sculptures derive their original and essential meaning from the immediate context of one another, the sanctuary they share, and the city for which they were created. Apart from one another, in the British Museum, they are merely relics, however finely wrought. The wholeness of the Parthenon demands our respect 
and warrants our every effort to reunite, to reunify it such as we can. Let us for a moment consider the state of the central figures of the West Pediment. Poseidon's shoulders are held in London, while his pectoral and abdominal muscles remain in Athens. Athena's battered head, neck, and right arm are displayed in the New Acropolis Museum, while her right breast remains in the British Museum. This deliberate and sustained dismemberment of what are some of the most sublime images ever carved by human being, humankind, brings shame on those who work to uphold this state of affairs. And that state shame belongs to the British Museum and the British government, which insists that these stolen sculptures, half of them, should remain. Now, I want to say a word about their history, about the fact, undeniable fact, that they were stolen. In 1780, the French government asked to buy them. The Ottoman Empire, which was very solicitous of temples in its occupied areas, refused. So when Lord Elgin came on the scene in 1800 as the British ambassador, he knew that they weren't for sale. He knew that. He was a Scottish lord. He wasn't an English lord, although he wanted to be. And he was persuaded that it would help his campaign to be an English lord if he brought these examples of classic Greek sculpture to Britain. That's why he got them, he, he put together a big team of workmen and they went, uh, as he asked, for molding, for drawing, for picking up pieces of marble on the ground. That was all that he asked for because there had been a big explosion during the Venetian War, and there was a lot of rubble around the Pentagon, lots of, around the, the Parthenon. There were lots of uh, pieces of stone of pentelic marble lying on the ground, as well as the wonderful sculptures uh, on the, the metopes, on the walls, and the frieze, that incredible living almost document. It, if you walk around it in the British Museum, it's as though it's some old newsreel <laughs> of black and white 2,500 years ago, showing how people in the first democracy, in the first uh, state that we can call civilized, went about talking and walking and drinking, there was quite a bit of drinking, and uh, it's as though it's an old real newsreel photograph coming to life. Uh, and what has happened is that it's been torn in half. And the question is how we can reunite the two parts. Because Elgin, it's interesting to look at the facts. How did Elgin get them? Well, there were two governors a military governor and a civil government, governor in Athens. They were both Turks, and they were responsible for entry onto the Parthenon, and Elgin's workers were having difficulty getting on in order to draw and mould. So Elgin got one of his mates at the port, the sublime port the, where the sultan was and ruled, to write a letter to the governor saying that Elgin's workmen should be allowed on because Britain had just beaten Napoleon in Egypt and was very popular in Turkey at the time. And this letter simply asked for the workmen to be allowed in to make mouldings and pick up stones on the ground. Well, it then transpired that Elgin's agent, 
who happened to be a priest of some sort, Reverend Hunt, persuaded the two governors to allow his workmen to do more. What they did was rip off the sculptures, rip down the frieze, and cart it off to the garden of the British consul. Why were they allowed to do that? Why did these wretched Turkish governors turn a blind eye and allow this? They were bribed, massive bribes. <laughs> We've got the evidence. They were bribed with money large sums. They were bribed with <laughs> British coats and horses and uh, dueling pistols. They loved uh, to have silver-encrusted dueling pistols. Uh, it's all down in the records. That was how Elgin extracted that, uh, ripped off the marbles and was uh, and got off with them like a thief in the night through the British ambassador, through the British consulate's garden, and they were put on, mainly on British warships, and taken away. There was no permission from the Sultan. It would be necessary under the law of the place in those days, if you're going to despoil a temple, you need what is called a firman, a license from the Sultan. Well, people, historians have looked for many years in the records of the Sultanate and no license have they ever found because there never was one. Elgin was only allowed to pick up pieces of masonry and marble on the ground and to mold and to draw. There was no other permission, but by bribery and corruption, he managed to rip those wonderful sculptures off the wall, damaging them, cutting their backs off and so forth as they were brought down and uh, take them away. There's no conceivable doubt about that. And uh, when he became short of money, he tried to sell them to the British Museum, or actually to the British government. And Parliament in 1816 was pretty dubious. They had a debate and they condemned Elgin. They condemned him for his greed. They condemned him for misusing his position as British ambassador. He had a dreadful conflict of interest. He was making money out of his office and they were worried about that. And they were also worried about the fact that he had no title. He had no ownership. He couldn't produce it. When he was asked in the select committee to produce his title, he couldn't do it. He had nothing other than this letter, which was later found, that didn't give him any right to take the marbles. But he said, and he needed a cover story, and so he came up with one. He said, I only took them because when I went to Athens, they, I saw people picking up pieces, and I reckon these mischievous Turks, as he called them, to play on, on uh, racial stereotypes, he said these mischievous Turks would get rid of them. So I saved them. And this has been the British Museum story, cover story ever since. Elgin saved the marbles. No, Elgin, no marbles. This is nonsense. It's a lie because we did some work and pretty quickly found that Elgin had not even been in Athens until the following year. By the time he got to Athens, he bribed the custodians and ripped off at least half the marbles from the wall. So this damnable lie uh, gave him an excuse. So Parliament didn't like him very much. They didn't make him an English lord, but and they only paid him half what he asked, half his expenses. So he didn't make much money, and they were <laughs> the money that they paid him 
was uh, intercepted by his creditors and didn't get to him. But they nonetheless, uh, because he had no title, they had to pass a special law deeming, pretending that uh, the property in the marbles would be held by the trustees of the British Museum. And so that's the only reason why Britain has any claim through its own domestic law that was passed to cover up the fact that Elgin had stolen them. So that's, there it is, that's the truth. But it's the truth that the British Museum doesn't want to admit. It pretends that it obtained, that Elgin obtained them legally, which of course he didn't. But it tells a story on the front, on the wall, before you get into the Duveen Gallery, where they're displayed. Duveen actually was a criminal, an art forger who made a lot of money and donated this gallery where the marbles uh, unfortunately sit. But uh, the story that the museum tells on that outside wall is a lie, and it always has been. It changes. When my book was published, they rewrote it with another lie. So it's very amusing to look at what the uh, museum says from time to time about Elgin. He, at the moment, I went in the other day to see what its latest lie is. And it says this, and I quote, Lord Elgin acquired the sculptures in 1801. The British are very good at euphemisms. Acquire is... Uh, a neat word for stole. The Ottoman Sultan granted permission for Elgin, Elgin to retrieve sculptures from the Parthenon. What a lie. There is no decision by the Sultan. The Sultan never considered the matter. So uh, he never got the firman. And uh, it goes on to say the Parthenon scaffolding was suffering further damage at an alarming rate. It wasn't suffering any damage. People were picking up marble on the ground, but the only damage it suffered had been a century before from the Venetians. Goes on, Elgin appealed to Ottoman officials and was granted written permission, firmament, to remove peace, it quotes, pieces of stones with inscriptions, unquote. Well, that, of course, refers only to stones that had bits of marble he picked up on the ground, some of which did have inscriptions, but uh, it didn't for a minute cover his ripping down the sculptures on this temple. So I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say, that the British Museum simply lies, because it wants to keep its, uh, one of its prize exhibits. And uh, there the marbles have remained. There was a terrible time in the late 1930s when, because they were a nice brown color, the frieze originally was colored. And uh, Lord Duveen, this crook who owned the, was given the gallery, decided that he wanted them in white. He wanted them white. Mm. So he ordered the British Museum workmen to scrub them white. And in doing so, with wire brushes and uh, carbundrum and so forth, they uh, did affect them. They destroyed part of them. They did uh, quite terrible things to them. But the British Museum covered that up, and it was only with uh, St. Clair's investigation some years later that the truth came out. So the British Museum has not been the uh, custodian of, of the marbles. And there they are, stolen property, property wrongfully taken, um, 
Elgin, as I said, never paid a penny in 1810. He was trying to get the last uh, marble out. And uh, someone, the Turks by this stage, weren't in love with the British any longer and were making difficulties. And so uh, he had to provide a lot more bribes. And even so, uh, it was suggested that perhaps he might make a gift to the poor people of Athens who had had their temple despoiled. And he came up with the gift of a clock, a German clock. But he didn't provide a clock tower, so they had to build that themselves. And, uh, of course, in the end, the clock didn't work. So the people of Athens got nothing from having their temple despoiled. Well, what to do? How to get them back? There is only one thing. I mean, there is this terrible thing I find in Greece of a reluctance to take on the British government. I call it the Navarino syndrome, as though you're so grateful to the Brits for the Battle of Navarino, which ended the Ottoman Empire, <laughs> that you don't want to take them on in court. And you don't realize that Britain loves going to court. It's, uh, lawyers do much of the international work. And what is great still about Britain is that it obeys international law. Other countries don't, but Britain still does. So the only way of getting the marbles back is by threatening a legal action. The uh, government, your government doesn't, well, the last government uh, didn't buy that. I went out with Amal Clooney and the late Professor Norman Palmer to provide a basis for legal action, but that wasn't, uh, they weren't interested in that. Diplomacy, diplomacy. Well, you've been trying diplomacy for over a cent two centuries, actually. The first diplomatic request was by the King of Greece, back in 1836, when just after Greece won its independence. And from there on, it has been uh, pointless, fruitless diplomacy. It looked after the war as though Britain would consider returning them. The foreign office says they belong to Greece, and we should give it back to thank them, because Greece was the only other country in Europe that supported Britain in the battles against the Nazis. But uh, it looked as though there would be return, but uh, Melina Mercuri made her famous appeal. Unfortunately, Melina got up the nose of another very powerful woman, woman namely Mrs. Thatcher, who may be uh, who didn't seem to like her and who ordered that Britain would not return the marbles. And from then on, Britain has rejected all requests, all diplomatic overtures, and so forth. And uh, it was uh, an advance this year when your prime minister, who he and his wife are uh, very genuinely concern to get the marbles back and he went to London to see Boris Johnson who has a bust of per <laughs> Pericles from the British Museum on his desk and uh, it was interesting because after that meeting Johnson said it's nothing to do with the British government go and ask the trustees they're independent, we can't uh, influence them. Now, that was a blatant lie. Blatant. You know why? Because Britain, from 1963 onwards, has what is called a deaccession law. You cannot 
the trustees cannot give anything in their collection away, even to the proper owner. It's absolutely flat refusal. The courts have said so. The British Museum wanted to give back enough paintings that had been looted by the Gestapo from Jewish owners. And uh, the court prohibited them. They said, this is the law. You can't give anything from your collection out. And uh, so Parliament for the Jewish people change the law. The Australians decided they wanted their constitution back. It was lodged in a British national institution. Britain changed the law so Australians could have their constitution back. So the only peoples for whom this law has been accepted, changed, are the Jewish people in the Australia, not the Greeks. So there we are. How do we unlock the law? Because Boris Johnson knows that he's lying, but it helps him to get rid of the problem by saying it's all a matter for the trustees. It's not. The government has to change the law. How do we force the British government to change the law? The only language they understand is the language of the court. And in my book, Who Owns History, which I think is available in uh, a Greek translation, I suggest a way that that can be done by way of an advisory opinion given by the International Court of Justice. Britain won't accept a direct attack on it by Greece in the International Court, so Greece will have to persuade the members of the General Assembly to refer the matter to the court. Because I think, and I argue in my book, the reasons why international law is moving to the situation where it imposes a duty on colonial powers to return right cultural property that was wrongfully taken in colonial times. And uh, what is interesting is that this position is supported now by so many countries. And Macron was the first to enunciate it in relation to Afri African art. He says the art of Africa should not be imprisoned in European museums. And they are starting to return to places that were looted by French or British armies, uh, much of the loot. And so I think when Greece, just before the pandemic, December 2018, put down a supportive motion in the General Assembly, 104 countries supported it. So China supports it because, of course, it was looted brutally and barbarically in during the Opium Wars. It lost millions of, of, of beautiful artifacts. So um, I do think that this is the way forward, and I've described how it might be achieved. But because I can only uh, imagine that the British government will make the exception that it made for the Jewish, Jewish people and for the Australians if it is told by the International Court of Justice that it's time to give back, return property stole, wrongfully taken or stolen uh, during colonial times. So, that is my recommended solution, uh, and I think it must be
clearly established as the evidence that I've seen undoubtedly shows that those marvelous sculptures were in fact stolen by a man breach of breaching his duty as an ambassador for his own profit and his own benefit and ignoring the rights of the people of Athens. Thank you.